afternoon. And now the reincarnation man. Many people claim to have lived previous lives, and some religions, particularly in the East, incorporate the doctrine. But is there any evidence for the reality of reincarnation? An eminent American professor of psychiatry, Ian Stevenson, has considered it worth his while to devote most of his time, for several years now, to investigating reincarnation stories. In conversation with June Knox Moore, he describes his experiences. I had colleagues in America who would uh, take the position, well, uh, what do you want to study reincarnation for? Uh, everybody knows it's impossible. And in India, the position was, well, what do you want to study reincarnation for? As everybody knows that it's a fact. Dr. Ian Stevenson is professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. A few years ago, he gave up the chairmanship of the department to devote himself to the investigation of cases from all over the world of those who claimed they'd lived before. It was a highly unconventional step for a distinguished academic to take, and one which many fellow scientists viewed with some dismay. What was it then that drew Ian Stevenson to the subject of reincarnation in the first place? I became increasingly dissatisfied with modern theories of human personality and felt that present knowledge of uh, environmental influences and genetics separately and together were inadequate and that um, there was a great deal of metal to be eventually taken out of the ore of what we call paranormal phenomena and then uh, I think to make progress in science you have to specialize and uh, so I felt that there might be a particularly high yield of metal in the uh, cases of young children who say they can remember previous lives. The children who've been the subject of Professor Stevenson's investigations come from as far afield as Asia and Africa, Alaska and South America, as well as parts of Europe and the United States. There have been some adult studies too, altogether nearly 2,000 cases of detailed recall of earlier lives, with an average accuracy rate of 90%. Over the years, the publication of Professor Stevenson's findings in book form and reputable scientific journals has done much to give his work the seal of academic approval. But it was his first analysis of the subject, written for the American Society for Psychical Research in 1960, that marked the turning point of his career. The essay caught the attention of the celebrated medium Eileen Garrett. She passed on to him details of a child reincarnation report from a remote part of central India, and Professor Stevenson decided to travel there to investigate the story for himself. The child had, when she was uh, only three or four, uh, begun speaking about a previous life in another town and narrated uh, a considerable number of details about this life, uh, totally unknown to her family, about another family that her, her father and, and mother had, had no knowledge of whatever. And uh, then this was subsequently verified and that she was vindicated on uh, the statements she'd made. They were about 90% accurate. And she also was credited with recognizing a number of the members of this other family. Uh, some of whom tried to mix her up and it would, came sort of disguised or misrepresenting themselves. And she spotted them and said, no, no, you're not so-and-so, you're such-and-such. Have there been some dramatic examples of returns to remembered sites? Not exactly returns, but visits to a site that the child remembers? Uh, yes, I can, uh, particularly one that was one of the first cases I studied in Lebanon. And in, in that case... I uh, had a chance to record what the child had been saying before anyone had verified his statements in the village where he claimed to have lived. And then I took the child and his father over to the village after having identified fairly clearly a person who corresponded to his statements. And in the house where this man had, had lived, this child went around and made a number of statements about the deceased person that he, I'm sure, could not have known normally. The most startling, I think, of all was his pointing out where the deceased person had kept his rifle. And the deceased man's mother told me that she was sure that only she herself and her son knew where that rifle had been kept. 
Most of Professor Stevenson's fieldwork involves communication with children between the ages of two and six. After that age, the memories of a previous existence begin to fade, it seems, or are consciously suppressed. Many of the Asian children he investigates have never encountered a European before, so how does he set about establishing a rapport with his subjects? The last ten years I've had a very gifted Indian psychologist working with me, and she's uh, remarkably good at opening up young children. So if the child will talk with us, then fine, we will take down whatever the child would still say to us. And that varies. Sometimes they're shy with strangers, as it could be expected to be. Then we take the testimony of all the parents and the siblings, the older siblings particularly, um, and even neighbors and perhaps a school teacher and the head man of the village. Anybody who qualifies as a first-hand informant, I won't usually listen to second-hand informants, so we try to get them aside and just take the first-hand testimony and make notes uh, of what they say uh, pretty much verbatim, including what we ask. We put down the questions. And then we go to the other family and um, start all over again with the surviving members of the family. Can we touch now for a minute on the subject of, of hypnosis? Because thanks, or otherwise, to various books and, and television programs, the general public, in this country anyway, now equates, or tends to equate, reincarnation with these methods of induced regression. Is it something you, you've ever practiced yourself? Yes, I have occasionally, uh, but I regard uh, hypnosis with um, great reserve, especially when the subjects are adults. An adult subject uh, coming into hypnosis is uh, loaded with information that he's normally acquired. Then he's under hypnosis and very susceptible to the influence of the hypnotist who tells him that he's going to go back to some period before his birth. And he's almost obliged to come up with some sort of previous life that uh, I think in most cases is either totally imaginary or perhaps uh, historical fiction that's made to some extent out of his own reading or information that he's been exposed to and, and shaped into a kind of a novel to please the hypnotist. Mm. But hasn't hypnosis actually produced some rather striking examples of, of what I would call uh, speaking in a, in a tongue unknown to the subject? Yes, there have been a few cases like that, and those belong to the tiny group of uh, hypnosis cases that I think uh, should be examined carefully. I've studied two cases of, of that type myself. Those were cases of American housewives who, under hypnosis, spoke languages that I'm convinced they hadn't learned normally, in one case Swedish and in another case German. I investigated the earlier lives of these uh, American housewives, both of whom had only secondary school education, and they both insisted they'd never been exposed uh, to anybody uh, who spoke these languages, much less had they learned them themselves. And both could speak the languages not well. Uh, they were deficient in the language. They could speak it, um, to use a technical word, responsibly, by which we mean there could be an intelligible conversation going on. Uh, the German case particularly impressed me because I can speak German, and I participated in some of the sessions and spoke German with this subject in the hypnotic trance and got sensible answers in German to questions put in German from a woman who I'm sure had not uh, learned German in, in this life. But as far as children are concerned, Professor Stevenson relies entirely on the spontaneous recollection of past lives. Apart from memories, there are often other typical phenomena, unexplained skills, for example, that seem to have been acquired without either practice or inherited talent. I remember one child in Sri Lanka who was gifted at uh, preparing thatch for roofs and could put the palm leaves together very skillfully, and she'd never been trained to that. Her, her family were several cuts above the family of the person whose life she was remembering, and they didn't uh, bother with thatching. They had galvanized tin roofs. What about phobias and, and inhibitions? Do they come into Yes, that's much commoner. Mm. And uh, in about 50% of the cases... The child um, has a phobia, sometimes expressed very young, nearly always related to the mode of death of the person whose life is being remembered, so that if the child has a phobia of uh, water, say, or being immersed in water, I'm thinking now about an actual case in Sri Lanka where the, the child, even as an infant, freshly born, you might say, struggled and screamed and had to be held by a burly man in order to be bathed. 
so that stage that child couldn't speak but when she became able to speak she began uh, to narrate details of a previous life uh, in which the person whose life she was remembering had drowned and if the previous life ended in say a stabbing then there would be a phobia of bladed weapons knives and swords if it ended in shooting there'd be a phobia of firearms and so on you also lay great stress don't you on things like birthmarks and and deformities as possible evidence for your theories i do yes uh somebody who visited me recently a, a scientist and to whom i showed these uh, some of these um, cases and discussed them with him he said uh, well this is extremely interesting because uh, this evidence um, can be disputed as to its interpretation but at least the facts can't be disputed with regard to speaking of course about the birthmarks and birth defects whereas in your other cases uh, one can dispute the facts as well as the interpretation and I think he's quite right. But how would this particular birthmark or defect link back to a previous life? Can you give um, a simple example of that? Well, the simplest example would be the, the child uh, pointing to a birthmark and saying, this is where I was shot in the previous life, and uh, indicating a site where he, he says that the bullet entered the body that he had before. Couldn't you sometimes just attribute that to a child's fanciful imagination? Well, you could, uh, and, and you could also attribute it to the parents uh, making up something to uh, go with the birthmark. But then you've got the birthmark to explain. Some of your most dramatic cases, Professor Stevenson, have involved what I'd call gender change, you know, where somebody reappears in life claiming that they've been, uh, say, a man would claim he'd been a woman before. Oh, there are numerous examples of that. Burma is a particularly um, fertile area for the study of such cases and in Burma they um, run for a reason I don't understand to about uh, 25 percent of all our cases and um, these children uh, characteristically feel that they're they've been uh, deposited so to speak in the wrong sort of body and that they really should be in a body of the opposite sex and they will often dress in the costume the clothes of the opposite sex and play the games of the opposite sex and in general behave uh, as that sex would quite contrary to the parents wishes so far as i can tell one that has particularly uh, stayed in my mind uh, and one that i found especially moving is that of a burmese girl who uh, remembers the previous life of a japanese soldier killed in world war ii she spoke about having been with the Japanese army in Burma during World War II, a cook actually in the Japanese army, and that then uh, an airplane had come over strafing and the pilot had, had seen this soldier on the ground and had sort of circled around and machine gunned the soldier and, and killed him. And uh, then, according to her account, she got reborn in the same village where the soldier had been. And there had been Japanese detachments in the area because there was an important railway station nearby. And uh, this girl, uh, when she was young, uh, she had uh, a phobia for aeroplanes. She had nostalgia for Japan, grumbled about the uh, conditions in Burma, the heat, the spicy food, uh, wanted... Um, Japanese types of food, more sweets, raw fish, that sort of thing. And above all, wanted to be a boy and dressed like a boy and um, continued in that way intransigently, uh, would not wear a girl's clothes. And a crisis came and she was about 12 and the school authorities said, uh, if you're going to continue in school, you must dress as a girl and come as a girl. She said, I won't do that and dropped out of school which means that she's still, although intelligent, uneducated, and she just uh, makes a very meager living hawking at the railway station. But she's continued uh, uh, in her masculine style, expresses her wish to have a wife. And the last time I met her, uh, she looked at me and my assistant and, and said, uh, you can kill me any way you want, provided you'll guarantee that I'll be reborn a man. And then there are cases of identical twins from embryos formed by the splitting of a single egg. Although the genetic material here is identical, there are often striking contrasts in temperament. 
In Professor Stevenson's investigations, these seem to be explained by their totally unrelated former lives. A pair of young boys from Sri Lanka, for instance. One remembers the previous life of a simple, quiet schoolboy, and that happened to be verified. And everything he said turned out to be correct about the life of a, another simple sort of schoolboy who died uh, of some illness when he was about 12 or 13. And the, the, in that case, the two families were quite unknown to each other, and the distance was about 50 kilometers. Now, his twin, and, the, the, and these twins are identical, as I showed myself by studying their blood groups, his twin had a totally different memory. He started out to say that he'd been an insurgent, and there was an insurgency in Sri Lanka in 1973, with, uh, which was put down with a good deal of bloodshed. And uh, he wanted to say some more about it, and he did say a little bit, but his family ridiculed him, so he shut up. But the differences between these twins are so, so striking. The, let's call the, uh, the twin who remembered the life of the insurgent, the insurgent twin. He has insurgency sort of habits. He talks about guns and bombs, and he's a tough, and also rather, in his way, kind of frightful and tends to hide from strangers. And the other boy is quite different. Uh, he's sort of bookish and um, rather quietly sociable, but dignified and uh, comfortable with strangers. He, he doesn't feel hunted. Such cases as these lead one to ponder what might be called the mechanism of reincarnation. What are Stevenson's theories, for instance, about the point of entry of this reborn soul or personality? Well, on that point, we, all we know now is that it, it varies a great deal. It might go on over a period of time and not be sudden. There might be a sort of gradual um, assimilation, so to speak, or um, juncture between the uh, deceased person who is presumably being reborn and the um, embryo developing in the mother. We have cases in which the previous personality died after the subject of the case was conceived. Uh, even in some cases, several months. The mother was already pregnant several months. And then we have cases where the interval is, say, 20 years. Now, I think the question you're asking is one for the next century. If these researches generate successors who pursue the matter further, but I don't think that I'm in any position to answer that question now. Have you ever had any cases of apparitions appearing to the mother, the pregnant mother, of what is to come to her in, in the way of a, an offspring? Uh, yes, but to go back behind that, we have mm. very common cases in which the previous person appears to the mother in a dream. These are very common in Burma and Turkey and in the cases among the tribes of northwest North America. And in some of them, uh, after the dream, the mother wakes up almost expecting the, to see the person there as if there would be an apparition, but then sort of shaking herself and saying, no, that was a dream. However, I do know of uh, two cases, one is in, in Thailand and the other in Burma, in which the mother-to-be has actually been definitely awake at the time of perceiving the deceased person as an apparition. And in both of these cases, the subject later remembered that as the deceased person, he had manifested as an apparition to the mother. Would you speculate what is happening to the soul in the meantime, between its, you know, before its re-entry? Or is there, a, is there a continuous life going on that isn't recorded, reincarnation going on at all points, or, or does the soul wait to find a suitable well, vehicle? Yes, most of them have nothing whatever to say about this. It's just absolutely blank, but a few of them do, do say something about it. Occasionally they claim to have gone off and had what we call an intermediate terrestrial life, been reborn somewhere else, and then come back to be uh, reborn, as they seem to remember it, uh, nearer the first home, although still perhaps some distance away. Others may describe various experiences that they claim to remember, meeting perhaps uh, sages or holy figures in the discarnate realm, uh, much of this appears to be related to cultural beliefs, just as in the cases of people who almost die and then recover. Their experiences often uh, follow the 
expectations within a culture, uh, so that if this happens in India, the person is likely, if he meets some other person in the discarnate uh, realm, it's likely to be a, a figure out of the religion of, of India. Mm. Whereas if it's in the West, it's more likely to be a, uh, a figure out of Christianity. Critics of Professor Stevenson's theories are not slow to put forward arguments opposing his findings, painstaking and scrupulous as these are. The most popular of the alternative explanations is, of course, willful fraud by the participants. Fraud uh, does occasionally occur, and I've had a hand in exposing a few fraudulent cases myself, but I think it's very rare, unless I've been deceived much more often than I think I have. Telepathy? Telepathy, yes, commonly suggested uh, by Western observers of the cases. And I now, much more than I used to, question the parents about whether the child has shown any signs of telepathy or future telling and other paranormal powers. And occasionally they'll narrate some anecdote of the child uh, announcing an unexpected visitor a day or two before that visitor comes. But usually they say, no, absolutely nothing. Nothing beyond these apparent memories. Do you believe in the theory of possession at all? Well, yes, in principle I do, because if you can have uh, a discarnate existence, and it's certainly uh, possible to conceive that a discarnate personality might influence uh, a living person and even impose uh, memories on a, a child. This is actually an old explanation for reincarnation cases, and it goes back at least to the 18th century when the Swedish mystic and philosopher and scientist Swedenborg uh, suggested it as an explanation for what he thought were false memories of previous lives. But I don't find it uh, an attractive hypothesis for most of the cases. Now, this subject of, of counter-arguments, uh, is there yet another one that would carry particular weight with you, I wondered, in investigation? Uh, yes, there is. I think you mentioned uh, hidden memories that we use the word cryptomnesia for. The child may perhaps have learned uh, without being aware and without his parents being aware information about the person whose life he's recalling. That, I don't think, occurs very often. But a much more important counter-explanation, in my view, is a mixing up of the memories by the informants. But when we only reach the case uh, months or maybe years later, the two families have met, as they often do, and met repeatedly. Uh, then, from their own enthusiasm, and quite unwittingly, they may uh, credit the child with having remembered more before they met than he really did. If reincarnation should prove to be our common fate, as taught by so many Eastern and primitive religions, why then is recall so rare? And how closely is it related to the religious and cultural background of the individual concerned? Well, on the matter of rarity, uh, we don't know how rare it is, and it may not be anything like as rare as it seems. The fewer than 2,000 cases that uh, I happen to have collected and investigated over 20 years is, I think, almost certainly a mere fraction of everything that goes on. And the rarity in, in the West is because of perhaps our cultural inhibitions about the subject, lack of religious rapport with the whole idea. I think that's part of the, the reason, yes. We hear about cases in the West. I, we hear about three or four Western cases every year. Uh, I had a letter just the other day from a woman in America, and it's so typical I could almost read it without opening the envelope. Uh, those, these letters begin, um, My grandson is now 13 years old. I wish I had paid more attention to what he said when he was three. At that age, he was saying so and so and so on, but we told him to stop fibbing. And uh, now he says he doesn't remember anything of what he said. So I'm convinced that a lot of cases are lost in that way mm. uh, or come to our attention only later. Uh, have you collected any valid cases that you regard as valid in this country while you've been here? The one I was thinking of particularly was the, the Cumbrian lady. Well, that's a new case that I'm not really no. ready to speak about, but it's a case of a person who's had um, recurrent vivid dreams since she was about 10, nightmarish dreams, always the same. And um, they seem to go back to uh, a particular battle uh, in which one of her ancestors was involved. And so the explanation of this case 
uh, might be inherited memory. That's something we hadn't previously mentioned as an explanation for the cases, but it is brought into a certain number of cases. Professor Stevenson has now been researching into reincarnation claims for over 20 years. His investigations have taken him all over the world, and his record of case histories will soon near the 2000 mark. However dramatic his findings, though, however scholarly his research, there'll always be opponents of his theories. What, then, are the particular aspects of his work that give him sufficient motivation to continue? Oh, mainly the studies of uh, the sex change cases, the uh, twins, and the cases with birthmarks and birth defects. And uh, I'm also encouraged by uh, some expressions of interest on in the part of uh, scientists in other disciplines uh, who are beginning to think that uh, perhaps after all there's something to what I've been doing that's worth looking into further. What about the general philosophical implications? I mean, would there have been any effect on your own religious or non-religious convictions, I wondered? Yes, uh, yes, there has been. But uh, that's something that's almost uh, too deep to express, and one can't, I uh, can't uh, pinpoint any uh, special turning point. It's probably a uh, very gradual process. I do remember uh, an interview I had with a Swami when I first went to India that completely drained me of any thought that the world would be reformed by uh, the spread of uh, a belief in reincarnation that might come through study of evidence bearing on it. Uh, that was in 1961 when I first went to India, and I, I guess I must at that point have had uh, some of this sort of missionary zeal. So I had a letter to this uh, Swami. I went to see him, and um, he asked me what I was doing in India, and I explained briefly. And um, then there was a silence that seemed to go on from very long time and he said nothing and I began fidgeting a bit and wondering when I was going to hear his response and finally he said yes quite right uh, we here in India uh, know that reincarnation occurs but you see it doesn't make any difference because uh, we here in India have just as many rogues and villains as you have in the West and that was the end of the interview I was more or less dismissed <laughs> I suppose what you're always looking for and still searching for is the perfect case. Uh, not really, no. When I think about the perfect case, but don't expect to find it. But I've imagined it, and of course I'd be delighted to find it. All the cases have flaws, and I don't think that I'm going to uh, live to find the uh, perfect case. But uh, it's fun to imagine what it would be like if you could find it. Have, in all your researches, you ever had any inklings yourself of similar experiences or traces of experience going on inside yourself? Nothing that I would uh, put on the record. I'm not subject to a case myself. In fact, I'm rather puzzled by people who want to remember previous lives. I get a lot of mail from people who ask uh, whether I will hypnotize them or recommend a hypnotist. And my short answer to, to them is usually um, Sufficient unto the life is the evil thereof, to paraphrase a great teacher. Professor Ian Stevenson was talking with June Knox Moore. The Reincarnation Man was produced by Barbara Crowther. And you may like to know that there's an article based on the Reincarnation Man in the new edition of The Listener magazine, due out on Thursday.